Longevity is what everyone is seeking. A healthy body, healthy mind, healthy aging. Many times testosterone replacement therapy is considered uh, the hormone that makes work feel good. How vital is a person because a lot of our longevity is connected to lifestyle and behavioral choices. So simply, purely from a perspective of how do I behave, it makes a lot of sense to make people feel good, which means basically increased energy, mood and motivation. Sometimes I would be really tired during the day, so the sleep doctor had prescribed modafinil. The so, yeah. main dopamine reactive inhibitor in currently in existence since it was taken off the market 20 years ago. So I'm back with, with Mo, or he, he has a website called Desmolisium. Desmolisium. He is finishing up his medical program. It would like to be a doctor at some point in the space of longevity, uh, longevity medicine, which is uh, really the next step. It's not just a matter of fixing a problem like traditional medicine does when it arises. It's more than just uh, functional medicine. It's actually looking further afield and seeing what treatments, what options, what lifestyle interventions, what hormones can get involved now to ward off signs of aging later. Is, 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 that, is that right, Mo? Yes. I would say that when it comes to longevity, there are obviously countless different ways one I can approach this from. What I think, what's very neglected is the vitality component. By vitality, I do not mean cellular mechanisms of autophagy, of aging, of degeneration, but rather how vital is a person because a lot of our longevity is connected to lifestyle and behavioral choices. So simply, purely from a perspective of how do I behave, it makes a lot of sense to make people feel good, which means basically increase energy, mood, and motivation. And I would say that this is a very neglected area. And once I'll have my longevity practice, this is also what I'll focus on. So the, the good side of psychiatry, in a sense, not treating disease and pathologies, but well, how can I maintain the vitality of the 20s for a lot longer? That's very important, the vitality, because some of the uh, these so-called anti-aging treatments, the resveratrol and the CERT1 and, and uh, you know, NAD pathway, but, but even going back to the uh, cal caloric restriction that David Sinclair shows in animal studies and some people studies, it's all about breakdown and catabolism and you've got to feel miserable. It just sounds miserable. Even if the thought of autophagy kind of makes sense, you get rid of the, the senescent old cells and clear it out. But even that just sounds almost like you're giving someone chemotherapy. And I think in some cases that is, that just sounds awful, right? You don't feel great if you're on those treatments necessarily, or you might not feel anything. But an area that, that we, we had discussed before, and I had also come to the realization, uh, partly due to this whole internet buzz around TikTok around methylene blue and you know, talking about MAOI, uh, MAOBs, I thought, well, there's got to be more to this whole picture than, than just feeling rubbish so you can live a long time, but to feeling optimal, healthy, like I said, uh, vitality. And, and that's through, I think, the dopamine pathway. And what, I mean, you, you write about that on your website, Desmolisium, and it's, it really stands out because there aren't a lot of people that really talk uh, in, in those terms. You know? And now we approached many topics and I can go in many directions. Let's talk about the dopamine pathway. Uh, your dopamine house connected dopamine, libido, and well-being. We just briefly, since we are TRT channel, many times testosterone replacement therapy is considered uh, the hormone that makes work feel good. But really, I, I would think, and you might agree with me, that's done through the pathway of, of dopamine. Testosterone, uh, especially injections, but other forms of testosterone can uh, can boost dopamine to a certain degree, serotonin. It's probably the dopamine at the end of the day that's making work feel good or easy. What, what, what do you think? Yes. So if we talk about in terms of hormone replacement therapy, so there's definitely a lot of certain receptors sitting in the ventral tick, which is the area in the midbrain that's producing dopamine. Firstly, going into the limbic system, basically making the basal ganglia loop and finish completing movement, which goes awry in Parkinson's disease. But then also going into the mesocortical system, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is connected to focus and um, attention mainly. And these systems usually work together. So the one system that's going into the, it's called the ventral tegmentum, the nucleus accumbens, that's producing the motivation and not pleasure, but rather the wanting, quote unquote, because there's a misconception dopamine causes pleasure, it's rather the wanting. Uh, at the same time, the mesocortical system 
makes the organism or the mammal more focused so it's better at pursuing the wanting and this is what both systems together it's what we call motivation and it also feels good so it basically let's say you have fasted for two days and you're sitting in front of your favorite dish and that's what dopamine feels like this this craving this wanting and it has a lot to do with well-being and it also has a lot to do with agency so as people age we lose about eight to 12 percent of dopaminergic neurons per decade so simply due to that, it makes sense that dopamine enhancement brings back some of the vitality that's lost as people age. Obviously, there are many other things that change, but dopamine is definitely neglected because you mentioned testosterone. There are two hormones that increase dopamine quite a bit. First one is cortisol, so it increases it even more than testosterone. And what the honeymoon phase people feel at the very beginning of starting on a testosterone placement is usually due to dopamine hypersensitivity. So basically all these dopamine receptors and all the dopamine signaling cascade hasn't been turned on as much for a long time. And whenever neurotransmitters change, so the rate of change is very important here, that makes people feel good until the sensitization of these receptors will back down to an equilibrium. It's probably still elevated above baseline, but it's not as pronounced as it was at the beginning. And that's why some guys are always somewhat chasing that initial feeling that they had when they when they started. And I don't understand why why does it continue? But that that could also happen with other dopaminergic agents. That's, it's, I know it's uh, part of homeostasis, but it, it is quite a nice feeling when uh, when you can reach that point. Sometimes I would be really tired during the day, so the sleep doctor had prescribed modafinil. It's a yeah. dopamine reactive inhibitor in currently in existence since it was taken off the market twenty years ago. Wait, what was it called? The one? I mean, tin. Tin was basically, it's very old and they used it quite a lot in Europe as an antidepressant. It's a pure dopamine reuptake inhibitor and feels like modafinil with a punch. But they've taken it off the market because obviously it's faster molecule peaks in the bloodstream, the more pronounced the euphoria. For example, modafinil peaks very slowly. There's comparatively little euphoria. Cocaine peaks very fast. There's a lot yeah. of euphoria. I'm not thinking it's somewhere in the middle. And there were people reporting of spontaneous orgasms, for example, on Aminaptin. They had taken it off the market mostly because of the risk of addiction. There were some other medications. I think there was something called nomofensine, yes. which is an offensive class. But that was taken off because it created an immunological response. Some yes. people, they couldn't determine which. It, it had created this complex with the white blood cells and it got attacked by the immune system and they had hemolytic anemia. Now, for some of our patients on TRT who end up having a high, stubbly eye, hemoglobin hematocrit and red blood cells, that might not sound like such a bad thing, but I think the off-target effect is probably damage to the kidneys as a result of the, of the, of the breakdown of your red blood cells and probably no way to actually control how many red blood cells that it, that it eats through, it burns through. So so there were, there were some more, I guess the stronger, the quicker the rush into, into uh, boosting dopamine, the more likely it has a more of an addictive property which would make sense and then it does if it's not very long lasting and then even then right you would you have the risk of uh, desensitization of those dopamine receptors and then in which case you would it, it wouldn't have the same effect right uh, and you'd need more and more of a given amount of medication to get that that effect which isn't what we're trying to go for here we're trying to maximize youthful healthy uh, dopamine now one of the you said dopamine decreases about 13 percent per decade and, and we we're talking about there are certain enzymes in the body that break down dopamine so it limits its availability so monomines so serotonin dopamine or adrenaline they need to be metabolized because simply it does the body the, the way the body deals with things it just produces things then breaks them down again and there are two enzymes that evolved by a gene duplication. One is monamine oxidase A, which breaks down all three monamines, probably roughly equally. And the other one is monamine oxidase B, which um, breaks down dopamine and trace amines. Trace amines would be phenylethylamine, for example. So the uh, chocolate amphetamine. Right. There's lo located in different neurons. So monamine oxidase A is located in pretty much every neuron. Um, monamine oxidase B is located more it's more located to dopamine pathways and these enzymes um of course they go up and down with age and, and etc but there's also a lot of um, change that happens to the dopamine synthesis the dopamine signal along these pathways but all else being equal if you basically inhibit monomine oxidase b you have more dopamine available that's packaged into the vesicles which is then released and can signal on the target neuron 
It's probably the most natural way to increase dopamine levels because let's say you use a dopamine reuptake inhibitor like modafinil or, or I mean, Aptin. The appropriate. Or, yeah. Apropion only has a, um, they say 300 milligrams, so a standard clinical dose, only 20% of that. Um, so dopamine transporters are occupied, which is quite low. But with modafinil, it's 50 to 60%. With methylphenidate, it's even higher. With cocaine, it's even higher. But bupropion is more a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, which increases dopamine in prefrontal cortices. But in terms of the mesolimbic increase in dopamine levels, bupropion is not very good. For some people, it's better than others because it depends on what the shit enzymes you have. Because bupropion has quite an affinity for dopamine transporter, going into a little bit into pharmacology here. The major metabolite, hydroxybupropion, which is five to six times higher in the bloodstream once um, steady state levels are reached, it's mostly a pure noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. So for most people, the noradrenaline pathway is much higher than the dopamine pathway. But here comes the thing. In the prefrontal cortex, that so dopamine transporter expression is very low. It happens via the noradrenaline transporter. So if you inhibit the noradrenaline transporter in the prefrontal cortices, you elevate dopamine selectively in the prefrontal cortex, but not in the mesolimbic system where most of the dopamine um, reuptake is done by the dopamine transporter. Where in the brain do you want dopamine to be to be the highest for libido? In the mesolimbic system. So basically the nu- so the dopamine, so there are three dopamine pathways, there are four dopamine pathways. We'll just neglect the olactin pathway for a second. So there's two dopamine pathways in the mesolimbic system, and there's one that's going in the cortical system. So basically there are two, there is in the, in the, in the midbrain, there are two nuclei. There's the substantia nigra, and then there's the ventral tegmentum. The substantia nigra is what's producing dopamine and shooting it into these motor loops of the basal ganglia. If that's broken, then you have these Parkinsonian symptoms where you're jerking and where you can't move automatically. So the automatism of movement is lost. And then the other two is one is the same thing as the motor pathway, but going into the emotional areas of the brain. So in this case, the ventral and which is the nucleus accumbens, first and foremost, but also the anterior cingulate cortex, which has a lot to do with emotional processing, the orbital frontal cortex also with a lot to do emotional decision making. And dopamine in these pathways, obviously there's a lot of different things, but it among other things, it elevates the perception of motivation, agency, libido, it also modulates appetite. So basically all the the wanting and all the the goal-oriented behaviors take place in that. And the dopamine in the prefrontal cortical system, basically dopamine at the same time as it goes into the mesolimbic system, so the whole motivation, libido, everything stuff, um, it also goes into the mesocortical system, so in the prefrontal cortex, where it activates attention, selective attention, planning, simulating, all these things. So which makes sense evolutionarily because the wanting is triggered. So let's say you want to crave chocolate at the same time the pathways are turned on that help planning, that basically help creating a goal or um, directed plan. How do I get to the chocolate? But you want to elevate it mostly in these in the mesocortical and in the mesolimbic system. So the, the substantia nigra is just the normal movement kind of thing. Right. The other way to, I guess, boost dopamine or the dopamine receptor is with dopamine agonists, and which can be uh, some. Well, are prescribed in for those who have elevated a prolactin or well, prolactinomas or prolactinemia. And I don't know if you had much experience with dopamine agonists at all. I personally don't have much experience with it. Our colleague friend who is a psychiatrist, he does a lot of research using these drugs for treatment-resistant depression. And they can be quite powerful because, as said, depression is a super heterogeneous term. And dopamine is definitely one of these, the Cinderella transmitter has been neglected. So a lot of focus is on the serotonin system, which is 100% important, also the noradrenaline system. But the dopamine and dopaminergic system has been mostly off limits, partially because it dopamine agonist or dopamine reuptake inhibitor or anything dopamine modulating many times causes self-administration in rats. And whenever a compound causes self-administration in rats, it's thrown out before it's used or before it can be studied, simply because it's an indicator that it may be causing addiction. And it's yeah, I like that. <laughs> that's been, it's probably not the, the smartest way to go about to find life enriching molecules because obviously it's just a limitation to the research. But dopamine is super important for, for depression because if one could argue that certain forms of depression, especially the apathetic kinds of depression, if you increase dopamine, then you just have this more wanting, you get more joy, you get more life force. You can see that happens, what happens when people are giving antipsychotics. 
So whenever I worked in psychiatry, usually when people are giving antidepressants, they change a little bit. But with antipsychotics, it's a huge effect on, on personality. So antipsychotics usually will come in the receptors, but they particularly block the D2 receptor. The D2 receptor is the receptor where um, Pramipexol, for example, um, works on. And these D2 antagonists, one could argue that they take out quote-unquote life force. People become anhedonic. They just want to lay around, do nothing, which is good if they are suicidal or if they are psychotic. But it's not a great way to... So taking... Uh, so if, if, there, if the, the faucet drips, it's not a good way to basically turn off the whole water supply to the house. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button and subscribe for more content on hormones and men and women's health. And until next time, take control of your body and your health.